Okay, good morning, everyone, and welcome to this um, seminar, which is jointly organized by uh, the Institute of International Economic Studies, where I work at SNS. Well, it's SNS that does everything, <laughs> but we do one thing. We we try to bring uh, speakers uh, to this place and uh, discussing interesting uh, issues. And of course, this is an example of a, a very important issue. Uh, so we're going to discuss, as you know, today, one of the consequences of war, the economic consequences. And we have some very prominent guests that are going to give some uh, introductory uh, remarks. Uh, and we're going to save at least uh, 15, 20 minutes towards the end for for a general discussion where I hope that also you will want to participate. So I'm not going to say much more. I'm just going to start by introducing the first speaker, which is my very good old friend, uh, Josef Zira, Josef Zira, who is a professor at the Hebrew University. He has been working on macroeconomics, uh, social mobility with me uh, over the years, and many other things at uh, the Hebrew University and also many other universities around the world, including the best. Uh, and he is also an expert on the Israeli economy, he recently written a book about that. So, Yossi, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Let me first introduce briefly the map of Israel, and you can see the contested areas, which are the West Bank and Gaza, at least contested between Israel and the Palestinians. There is also a small problem of the Golan Heights, which is contested between Israel and Syria, but I'm not talking about it now. Okay, so when we talk about the conflict, we have to be, to make it clear that we're talking about two types of conflicts over the time. There is what I call the narrow conflict and the wide conflict. The narrow conflict was the conflict between Israel and the Palestinians. That was a conflict, for example, until May 1948. And the, then the conflict expanded to a conflict between Israel and most Arab countries, at least the neighboring Arab countries. And then after Israel signed the peace agreement with Egypt, in a sense, this wide conflict narrowed significantly because the Arab countries could not have a significant, serious fighting coalition against Israel without Egypt. It's obvious. So in a sense, we returned to the narrow conflict between Israel and the Palestinians. Now, why it's important economically? As you'll see soon, the white conflict was a war between conventional armies with tanks, air, air forces, even sea. So it was a very expensive conflict. While the conflict between us and the, and the Palestinians is not between conventional armies, it's, it's a militia warfare. And militia warfare is not expensive, usually. It can be can give you, it can hassle you, it can be problematic to run your daily life, but, but it, it is not a significant cost. To show it, you can look at this graph, which presents the defense cost of Israel. From its very beginning, our first year that we have statistics is 1950, until 2019. Now, it's all in percentage of GDP. So we have low costs in the early 60s, and then the costs jump all the way almost to 30 after the Yom Kippur War. So you can see a number of things here. First of all, this is the period of the white conflict. And the white conflict is not necessarily always costly, but when the conflict erupts, like what happened after 67, you can see the jump in military costs after 67 goes all the way to at least around 20% of GDP and in some periods even much more than that. And you can also see that around 1980, there was the peace with, the, with Egypt. And then you can see a precipitous decline of defense costs as percentage of GDP to something around 5-6% today. 
Now we have to, to keep in mind that sometimes you see the jumps, the jumps are not necessarily some like local jumps. This is usually when you buy a big chunk of American airplanes or stuff like that. So if you look at the domestic costs, they are much smoother. But clearly, the intensification of the conflict happened in 67 when Israel conquered the territories and decided not to withdraw. Because if you look at, the, at what happened in 56 when we conquered Sinai, we were pushed by the US and the Soviet Union to retreat after a few months and the cost went down significantly. So it's, it's, the, it's not only the six day war, it's more than that. It's the decision to stay in the territories that intensified the conflict. And only when Israel gave back Sinai and signed the peace agreement, it, it, it reduced the cost. Now, there were additional costs at the time. So in addition to the defense costs, there were other costs that were rising after 67. One of them was interest payments because the cost increased, <laughs> income of the government didn't increase that much. So they had to finance it by debt. And if you have higher debt, you have to pay more interest payments and interest payments jump from around two to something like 10. The second thing is support to the business sector. Not only that there was a conflict, but Israel uses a lot of reserve soldiers. And after 67, a big chunk of the working population went for reserve service something like three, four, and even half a year every year. That means that many businesses were suffering and were coming to the government for help, and the government needed to help them, mainly through subsidies to exporters and through very cheap uh, credit. And there were also personal transfers. Some of them went up for other reasons, but a lot went up because of the inflation that developed. And since Israel, the government used to subsidize some basic foods, that increased the cost significantly. And inflation was also the result of the rise of the defense costs. So, so there was a combination of expenditures and a result, we, sorry, we, we had a, a, a significant fiscal crisis. This is the picture of fiscal policy in Israel actually from 1960 to the present. You have the black curve, which is public expenditures. You have the blue curve, which is public income. This is of the whole public sector, government, municipalities, universities, hospitals, and so on. And you have the difference between the two, which is the, the deficit. Now you can clearly see that before 67, not only that the budget was balanced, but we had a surplus, mainly because of the German reparation money. But after 67, expenditures shot to the sky, defense, subsidies to the business sector and so on, interest payments, all these things I described before. And there was a, and, and then came the, in 85, the, the stabilization plan that reduced the deficit. And they didn't understand it at the beginning, but in a retrospect, we can understand that it was possible only because of the peace with Egypt that enabled it to, to be permanent in a sense. Okay, but let me go now to the stage we are in for many years, for, for more than 40 years, which is the narrow conflict between us and the Palestinians. It seems to be not so costly, five, six percent of GDP. But there are additional costs that we have to think about which we sometimes, there are many other costs and I have a full list in the book and I'm not gonna give you the list now. But I'm gonna, I want to focus on two types, two costs, which we call usually opportunity costs. Namely, we could have produced much more if there was no conflict. The first one is this. Now, look at the blue curve. The blue curve is the actual wages of Jewish men from the age of 18 to retirement. This is really from the data. It's not exactly the average because the average is a little bit jumpy. So I took a polynomial uh, uh, approximation. But the blue curve, 
And remember, people are earning more because after they finish high school, they go to university, they gain experience, they increase their human capital over time. And this is in new Israeli shekels for the year 2011. That's when I took the data. After 2011, they changed the statistics a little bit, so I prefer to stick to the old one. Now, there are four years here that the wages are still low. These are the, the three years of conscription and one year, usually, the trip abroad that soldiers take when they get out of the army. And sometimes it's even more. I think that the median age of entering university for Jewish men is now around 24. So the red curve is what would have happened if these people were born in Sweden. Then they will go immediately to college or in the US or wherever. So these two curves, so I, I'm taking the blue curve and just shifting it to the, to the left by four years, which means that there is a loss of human capital, not only during the time of the service, but mostly in most all, all of your career until the age of 50. And I can calculate it because I know the number of people in each cohort. I, I know how many of them work. I know how, how many of them served in the army. I do the same calculation for women as well. And then I add it up and it adds up to 5.7% of GDP. Of course, you can come and say, well, if there is, even if there's peace, there'll still be a conscript army. Okay, let's say a year for men and women, quite a lot. Then the loss is not 5.7% of GDP, but 4% of GDP, 4.3 to be precise, quite a lot. The second opportunity cost is even bigger. This is labor productivity in Israel and in the US. To make the comparison as scientific and as good as possible, I don't look at GDP in general, total output in the country, but only in the business sector. Because I don't want to confuse with the public sector that has, uh, it's, it's not selling its product in the market, so we don't have exactly, so I focus only on the business sector. These are the years of Israel catching up until 73. After 73, we grow at the same rate as the US, but on a lower level. And the question is why? So one explanation, a big explanation, is the fact that we have less capital. Here I compare the capital output ratios in the business sector in Israel and the US. You can see that in Israel, it's somewhere fluctuating around one. In the US, it's around 1.6. That explains a large difference in output. I'll show you in a moment the formula. And then comes the question, why the, by the way, if you're interested about Western Europe, like where you are, it's even higher than 1.6. It's around two in the business sector. So we are doing much worse than the US and much, much worse than Western Europe in that respect of capital abundancy. Okay, so now I'm gonna use two formulas. One is relating this is a standard assumption about production function, and I, I'm not going into the details. I'm just telling you, if you look at the upper equation, you see that K over Y, which is the capital output ratio, has a, an effect on output, on, our, on labor productivity, on output per worker. And you know, the alpha is a number we know. Economists know, you, you wake up an economist in the middle of the night, what is alpha? Alpha is one third. So we can calculate it. And we can tell you very easily what is the effect on output. So the fact that the US has 1.6 ratio of capital output and we have only one means that we could produce with the same level of capital output ratio 20% more. So we speak about a loss of 20, so, sorry, not 20% 20, 20 of the US, but 26% of Israel. So we could increase our GDP 
per worker, per capita, per everything by 26%. Added to the previous 4%, you got 30% loss. Now, why is our capital output ratio so low? You look at this equation. It's basically alpha, the same alpha from before, the third, that is similar to all countries, divided by this. What is this? This is the marginal cost of capital. This is how much is costing me to have an additional unit of capital. I have to pay interest to the bank, real interest rate. I have to pay depreciation. And there is some risk premium. Israel has a very good position in the capital markets. We pay around the same interest rate as the US. The rate of depreciation is also very similar because uh, the structure of our capital is similar. So we differ only in P, in the risk premium. Why we differ so much? Because of the conflicts. Of course, if I, if I speak about this in, to an Israeli public, they will immediately argue with me that it's different reasons for higher risk. But I think it's, we have to face reality and realize that for such a long time to have much higher risk can be only because of the conflict. Okay, let me summarize. So, conventional war is very expensive and may cause a fiscal crisis. But even the narrow conflict between Israel and Palestine has a lot of additional costs. They all sum up to something like 40% of GDP, but the two main ones are the conscription, human capital, and the, and the risk. Finally, I must add, because we have to, to realize that life is even harder for the Palestinians and their cost is much higher. So I was asked by the organizers to say a few words about the cost to the Palestinians. I don't know about the total cost, but in 2015 in the X group, we did this, I, me and some colleagues did a study on economic development in Palestine. And the results were devastating. The annual average rate of growth of Palestinian GDP per capita is low, 1%, compared, for example, 1.8 in Israel, US. But it's misleading. It's much lower than that. Because most of this grow growth happened in the 90s, when Israel started to bring foreign workers to replace the Palestinians, and the Palestinian workers returned to Palestine. So they increased the GDP but they reduced the income because their income in the, in the West Bank was much lower or, or in Gaza was much lower than in Israel. And after that, there was almost a long period of stagnation from 1996 to 2013. Th that's the last year that I studied, but I presume that it didn't change by much since. Now, why is this stagnation? When we tried to find it, there were two things. You know, usually, there are two things that affect the productivity of a country, the labor productivity. One is the total factor productivity, the overall productivity of the economy, and the other is the amount of capital. So productivity became very low because of restrictions to mobility, restrictions to mobility in the West Bank, not to mention the siege on Gaza and the lack of mobility between Gaza and the West Bank. This is, we calculated it, it's a huge cost. And the second thing is lack of investment. Part of it is for similar reason to Israel, the risk, the risk of the conflict. So businessmen from Arab countries and any other place are not investing in Palestine because it's a risky business. But also because there are restrictions on physical investment but imposed by Israel. For example, the dual use things. The dual use means that if you bring any material that might be used for producing a bomb, it's forbidden. And th there are some general international agreements on dual use things, but the, the policies that Israel is imposing on the Palestinians are much, 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 much stricter than that. So all these kind of, and of course, it, a lot of it is driven also by pressure from Israeli industrialists who want to keep on exporting to the 
to the territories instead of uh, helping local uh, industrialists uh, develop. But the bottom line is the bottom line that, that there is no increase in capital and productivity is hampered significantly by problems of mobility. Thank you very much. Uh, so sometimes you hear the argument, uh, so st stay up and so you can answer. <laughs> sometimes you hear the argument that, you know, there are positive spillovers of war and at least of, of military spending that, you know, it increases the labor force, there are technological spillovers, there are demand effects, people learn things during conscription. Is there any truth in these arguments? Some of them, there's no truth in that. Some of them there is, but it's very limited in size. For example, a lot of people say that the Israeli military industries do very well in exporting military goods, sometimes to very bad people. <laughs> but and, and they succeed in that because there is some, uh, what we call, uh, it's tested in battle. That is true. But when I look at the figures, the figures are not so large. And uh, actually, I, I, I give a full discussion <coughs> of that in the book. But uh, all these benefits from the conflict sum up in something like 2, 3, 4% of GDP. Negligible compared to the costs. OK, thank you very much. So we go on to the next speaker. So, so the technology is with us. Uh, so we are very happy to have Julia Markets with us uh, on uh, electronically, and here I see your face, so that's very good. Uh, so Julia is the head of the Center of Public Finance and Governance um, in the Kiev School of Economics, and also an, an associate professor in, in, in Kiev. Uh, and you are uh, research researching on, on similar issues that uh, Josef has described, but for the Ukraine conflict, so, so please. Please, Julia, the floor is yours. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thank you for having me today. Thank you for the opportunity to talk about the consequences of Russian full-scale invasion of Ukraine on the microeconomic situation and fiscal stability of the country. Uh, I just tried to switch the slide. Can I? On my side? Yeah, thank you so much. So... Um, the small reminder that the Russian aggression started in 2014 with the Crimea annexation and occupation of eastern part of Ukraine, but on the 24th of February 2022, the aggression became full scale and the Russian troops attacked the territory of Ukraine from south, east and north, as you can see on the map from the left side of the slide. And the consequences of this include social, economic, and financial ones. Every sector of Ukraine was harmed by the war, and every single region of Ukraine suffered from the war. Currently, Ukraine is experiencing an unprecedented level of destruction during the conflict, which is the most significant since the Second World War for the Europe. From the beginning of the full-scale invasion, we are in Kiev School of Economics, uh, together with partners in support of the Office of the President of Ukraine and government, started to assess damages, losses, and needs of Ukraine uh, infrastructure. And according to our last estimates, it's for June 2023, the total amount of damages cost to the infrastructure of Ukraine is increased to more than $150 billion. The biggest amount of damage was caused to housing, it's more than 50 billion, and to infrastructure, it's more than 36 billion dollars. But not only the key infrastructure in Ukraine was significantly damaged, but the Russian invasion had a direct structural impact on the health of Ukraine and macroeconomic situation and a fiscal policy. So Russian occupation led to the destruction of factories and manufacturing disrupted supply chains and reduced exports, causing Ukraine's economy to shrink by 29.1% in 2022, the year where the full-scale invasion began. The significant GDP reduction is mainly due to unavailability of production resources in the occupied or frontline territories. 
industries, trade, agriculture, and transportation made the largest contribution to the decline in economic production in these sectors. The military actions and problems in seaports also caused a 35% drop in export, which means less foreign currency coming to Ukraine. On the other hand, increased defense spending resulted in a 20% reduction in import. Inflation went up to almost 27% due to supply chain disruption and rising prices for food and energy. Despite these challenges, smart policies preventing a complete economic collapse. There are some signs of recovery now, a slow one, but still, and with a predicted GDP growth up to 3% in 2023 and up to 5 optimistic percent in 2024, supported by reconstruction efforts and gradual increases in exports and investments. Showing remarkable resilience, the Ukraine economy performed better than initial expectation, but however, there are still very high risks because of uncertain duration of Russia aggression against Ukraine. With the beginning of the war, the state budget was reoriented to military purpose. The primary finances of expenditures in the current year is aimed at increasing the country's defense capability and covering the most necessary social expenditure that ensure the support of population livelihood, especially for elderly people, internally displaced people who are right now millions of them, unemployment citizens. All other capital expenditures and non-crucial ones were frozen. After the February 2022, the war shock made the revenue situation more complicated. It then became difficult to accumulate the revenues needed to finance the record growth in the expenditure, especially when almost 90% of all tax and non-tax revenues, excluding the contribution of international partners, was being spent on defense. In this case, international aid, especially in form of grants, became the key resource to cover social budget expenses. Uh, the budget for 2024 next year that was adopted by the government of Ukraine last week includes revenues amounting to $67 billion, which is 26% higher than the current 2023 plan. And it means that the growth in revenue can be attributed to an optimistic macroeconomic forecast, like 5% of GDP for the next year. For the third consecutive year, the budget deficit has exceeded one-digit numbers and is planned for 2024 as 20.4% 20 of GDP. This is uh, because of the need to finance defense expenditures, slow economic recovery, and limited possibilities for increasing tax revenues. In 2023, the planned budget deficit was increased from 20.6% to 27% of GDP. Consequently, by the end of 2024, the expected level of national debt will reach 110.7% of GDP. It's compared to 27% in 2023 and 78% in 2022. And similarly to the previous years, the majority of the debt is almost 80% or $43 billion planned to raise abroad from the international financial institutions and bilateral partners. Ukraine required a significant amount of budget support and recovery financing in 2022 and 2023 years to maintain the defense, and these figures can grow significantly as the war and destruction continues. Ukraine requires significant budget support. It expected, as I said, 43 billion for 2024 and needs to finance of the most crucial recovery needs. From the beginning of full-scale invasion, partners and donors supported Ukraine's macrofinancial stability for more than $60 billion. But overall, Ukraine would require more than $400-$500 billion for the next 10 years to recover only physical infrastructure damage destroyed by Russia and at least uh, $300 billion investments to revive the economy and converge with EU economically. In 2022, the immediate need for the rapid recovery assessment at $15 billion. From the beginning of the Russian full-scale invasion, the Ukrainian budget has moved from the budget of survival to the budget of resilience. 
the 2022 budget was reoriented to the wartime reality, and this approach is applicable for 2023 current year and as well as the next one, 2024. Defense and security spending increased by nine times compared to 2021 year and is fully financed by its own Ukrainian budget revenues. Ukraine needs and anticipates support from international partners in order to finance a significant budget deficit projected as almost 21% of GDP in 2024. Ukraine is suffering from huge damages and according to the World Bank assessments, estimated to cover needs more than $400 billion. For comparison, the Ukrainian GDP in 2022 was $200 billion. The source of finances of the recovery should include funds that will be received from the implementation of international compensation mechanisms for the damage caused by Russian aggression, confiscated Russian assets, proceeds from frozen Russian assets, and investment arbitration. And of course, the tax revenues of Ukraine, investment, and other financial resources attracted from the partners. Rebuilding Ukraine is a prosperous country, European Union, and NATO member as a stronghold on the continent is an important investment into security and well-being in the region. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Julia. It's um, astoundingly large figures that you present. Um, so, so I was thinking, for example, about the, the estimated cost of uh, coming back, uh, 400 billion or something. Uh, so have you dared started to think about how that could be used and for how long time uh, uh, that, that the rebuilding of Ukraine would take? Uh, unfortunately, according to the disruption of the infrastructure and other things like social ones, we see that it could take years. I mean, it could be decades of years, of course. And in this case, the support from partners to help Ukraine finance the budget, microfinancial stability is the one uh, thing, and it's definitely more than $40 billion, but uh, also the issue that how much money we will need to recover and build back better all of the fertilities that has been destroyed already, and it takes a lot of money and a lot of time, and uh, Ukraine hopes here for the investments, of course, because we need to push economic growth to support macroeconomic stability by our own and develop the most uh, prosperous country for our citizens. Okay, thank you very much. So we now we go to Johan Berggren. Uh, Johan is a state secretary at the uh, uh, Ministry of Defense, uh, working for the Civil Defense Minister. Uh, so, and you have been active uh, on the ground, as I understand it, in the Middle East, and also written recently a book. Uh, uh, only in Swedish so far, but you almost promised to give it in English soon. Uh, right. the, per the perfect conflict and perfecta conflict. And thank you. Thank you, John. And thank you so much for having me. It's, it's a real pleasure to be here. And thank you for the excellent presentations by the previous speakers. Really uh, very, very stark numbers that uh, that really make you think uh, about the consequences of war. So I was going to do uh, a couple of things and I'm going to try to be not to speak too long because I know we want to have a discussion, but just a few comments about uh, number one, about how we think about how civil defense, which is what I work on now, how that can help perhaps to mitigate uh, the, the possible consequences of war and all these costs that we've heard here. And then maybe if we have time, just maybe a word or two on some, some reflections from my time on, in the Middle East, uh, which was some years ago, where we worked more on the Palestinian side on their economy. But if we start discussing uh, civil defense, you know, civil defense is basically defined as all the activities in society that is not military defense. So it's uh, municipalities, regions, uh, healthcare, education, it's everything in society, the private sector that is not uh, military defense, the armed forces. And in Sweden, during the Cold War, we had a very uh, sophisticated, uh, expansive uh, civil defense system. We had thought about economic security and psychological security and so forth. We then had the end of the Cold War, we had a peace dividend. Uh, we, most countries in the, war, in the Western Europe and North America cut their spending on military and civil defense. And now, given the geopolitical situation and what's happened in Ukraine, we are now rearming both militarily and on the civil side. Now, civil defense is about uh, protecting the population, uh, ensuring continuity of government, and supporting the armed forces, broadly speaking. You can divide it more, in, in, you can subdivide it more as well. But it really is about the word resilience. How do we achieve uh, social, 
political and economic resilience so a society can function like in the incredible resilience we've seen in Ukraine, right? How the Ukrainian population and the Ukrainian society has continued to function despite the continuous attacks on infrastructure, on civilian infrastructure, on, on the people and, and, and the assets of Ukraine. So I'm just gonna mention a few uh, elements or aspects of civil defense that we're working on that I, obviously we hope they will never have to be used. We hope Sweden will never be in this kind of conflict that we're seeing in Ukraine. But the point is to try to be as prepared as possible for all kinds of contingencies. So one, one aspect, for example, is bomb shelters, right? Protecting humans, human population, human capital, you could say. How do you, how do you protect uh, the populations from, from, from bombs and attacks? In, in Ukraine, people have sought refuge in, in, in basements and shelters. In Sweden, we're fortunate to have 65,000 bomb shelters that cover about 70% of the population. This actually is a very, very high number uh, by international standards. In many countries in Western Europe, also in North America, surprisingly, there are very, very few bomb shelters. They've chosen a different approach. Uh, it's very expensive to build bomb shelters, but fortunately, during the Cold War, we invested significantly in this. We have an investment need to upgrade those bomb shelters, particularly to make them uh, more adapted to CBRN threats, chemical and nuclear, through better filters. But there, we have an example of how good preparedness could protect the population from, from bombings and from attacks. Another area is uh, security of supply, ensuring that we have supply lines, that we have uh, stockpiles of, 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 of um, oil, or grain or uh, healthcare supplies, things that might be difficult to procure that we saw during the pandemic, but that would also probably become difficult in a conflict situation. There, uh, we have a lot of work to do to build up these stockpiles, but it's something we're working uh, we're working on. Uh, one area, one uh, one way to do it is to actually build up, uh, you know, uh, having the physical stockpiles in warehouses. Another way is to look at how companies can reorient their production, uh, to, as we also saw a little bit during the pandemic. So security of supply is very, very important. Another area is uh, rescue services, what we call in Sweden, uh, Redningstjänst. Uh, and obviously we've seen how the rescue services in Ukraine have played a cr crucial role in very quickly, very effectively, very directly coming to uh, communities, uh, neighborhoods that have been bombed or attacked and very quickly dealing, saving the people, rebuilding, or not rebuilding, but getting rid of the, the rubble and trying to get uh, you know, traffic and everyday life to work as normally as possible. We, I've seen this in Israel too, how the rescue services have, 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 have uh, coped with this. So this is an area where we have fairly developed rescue services in Sweden. We need to invest more because in the time of war, rescue services also have to deal, they have to deal with much higher demands. Uh, another area is cybersecurity. Uh, cybersecurity, obviously, already in peacetime is a crucial area because we see cyber attacks increasing both from antagonistic actors, but also from uh, criminal syndicates and so forth. And we saw in, in Ukraine that uh, the Ukrainian society was attacked in the cyber domain and was able to be fairly robust and withstand those attacks. Uh, we're investing in Sweden and in much of Western Europe to build up cyber security and cyber defense uh, because we're such an online society and we're so dependent on the cyber domain. Uh, we also have um, you know, the need to counter disinformation. That's a very important part of civil defense. In Sweden, we're lucky enough to have an agency called the Agency for Psychological Defense that actually works on countering propaganda and false narratives. Uh, obviously, we need to make sure that this is not seen as something that's uh, monitoring or surveilling, uh, you know, uh, surveying the population. But it's about having robustness against, uh, again, negative narratives, false narratives, propaganda, disinformation coming from abroad from antagonistic actors. Uh, we've seen a huge increase in these kinds of uh, these kinds of threats, and that's another part of protecting the population and again making sure that the human capital and ultimately also the physical capital is there so uh, those are a few ways in which uh, civil defense if invested in if deployed if structured can help hopefully reduce the economic consequences of war but even with huge resilience uh, huge efforts amazing rescue services you see the huge cost that a war uh, will have but where civil defense is one way to try to, to protect the population um, just a just a comment on 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 the very interesting numbers from from, from Joseph. I mean, I, I work more on the Palestinian side on the Palestinian economy, but I very much recognize everything you said at the end about uh, the costs on the Palestinian side, the the issues around uh, labor mobility, around lack of investments. You know, one thing we looked a lot at was how can you get more investments into Palestine? Very complicated. Uh, also, getting things like investment. Uh, visas for external investors to come into Palestine and actually want to uh, spend money there and actually invest in capital. Uh, a lot of challenges, but we also estimated uh, 
uh, during the, the obama Kerry peace process in 2013, 2014, which I was lucky enough to talk about here about 10 years ago, which unfortunately was not implemented. But there we estimated that the Palestinian economy could almost double in size relatively quickly if a lot of these barriers were reduced and if it, in, in, uh, capital could come from abroad, if labor mobility uh, was, was allowed, if agriculture could be de developed. So th there's a huge potential uh, trying to see the glass half full and not just half empty. I think I should end there so we have time for questions and discussion. But uh, thank you very much for having me. Joseph, you can sum up also, please. So uh, just a question for you. Do you, th are, are, do you think that we can draw lessons from, from how Ukraine is defending itself? As, as an outsider, just reading media, one gets the feeling that a lot of the resilience come from sort of, you know, spontaneous organization and, and not centrally planned defense. Is, uh, and, and it goes to you too, Julia. Is, is there any truth in, in such a description? Yeah, I think that's a, that's a great point. And I think we have to be very honest in that we can make all the best preparations in the world. And we're trying to be as prepared as possible in Sweden. We try to prepare ourselves, right? But if we ever face these, this terrible scenario, we don't know exactly how it will develop, how people will react, how the scenarios will, will unfold. And so we have to be very flexible. We have to be very, I think you have to have a large element of decentralization as well. It will be municipalities and rescue services, and ultimately individuals who will have to act. And that's one reason why I'm optimistic, although I hope this will never happen. But, you know, Sweden is, this, and much of Northern Europe is a society of individuals that are strong, educated, uh, autonomous, who have innovation, who have ability to act, who I think in these kinds of circumstances would stand up uh, and, and act in the way the Ukrainians have. So, but it's, it's a big challenge. Julia? It's uh, also before the big challenge for Ukraine because, uh, yeah, it was a lot of things that no one wanted to believe actually. So that's why our preparation could be better than uh, than it was actually. But uh, also our government made the best they can in this uncertain period from the beginning of the full scale invasion. But the million of people just uh, leave their left their homes and move somewhere. And the infrastructure was completely destroyed in several regions of Ukraine. So. For now we have like cities that doesn't exist anymore so this is a huge uh challenge still for now but yeah we're trying to learn on our examples and of course made a lot to uh cover our expenses to make shelters of course as well this process still continues in ukraine and also another things that we need to support our population and our for example, people who are internally displaced or any other things, and also provide some infrastructure things. So this is the complex of measures that we're trying to do, because it's, of course, it's the first the issue with the human capital, because the country is for humans, and uh, people should be uh, confident that they live in a safety place. So this is a huge issue now, of course. Joseph, you wanted to say something? Yeah, I have two comments. One is to Johan, who, who spoke about civil defense. And actually, the things that you described, they are performed in Israel in a way. I, I put it in my book as examples for acts of defense which are not covered by the defense statistics because they are borne by the citizen. For example, whenever you buy, a, you build a new house in Israel, you have to put a, a very highly protected room inside, which costs more than usually. And that is borne by the people who build the houses, who, who pay, who buy them. Who, and the other example is the stocks of uh, fuel, for example. Or whenever you pump gas into your car in Israel, some small percentage goes to the stock of military gas. So, so a lot of these things, they are not counted as standard costs of defense are actually costs of defense that should be added, which is what we do. Now, speaking about what Yulia described, as I said in the beginning of my talk, I differentiate very strictly between the period of the wide conflict and the narrow conflict. The narrow conflict has different effects on the economy, for example, more recessions. But the wide conflict has a very clear had a very clear in the past, hopefully not in the future, of, of causing a fiscal crisis. And the numbers that Julia provided, uh, I, I think it would be even more helpful if some most of the figures would be in percentage of GDP and not just in billions of dollars, because 
you need the perspective and, compa and comparative ability. But the numbers show that uh, Ukraine is reaching a situation that it's developing a fiscal crisis that is that cannot be be fixed easily because if you have a deficit of more than 10% of GDP and the debt is accumulating, it's it's an unsustainable fiscal policy. Now I'm not blaming, of course, Ukraine, but I'm just saying that in such a case, if we look in the Israeli experience, you you realize that there is only one true solution to it, which is reaching a peace agreement. And the sooner the better. So I don't know who is in charge of that. But I think that both sides usually takes two to tango. And both sides should make big efforts to try to reach that. I have no idea about the fiscal policy of Russia today, for example, but I wouldn't be surprised if Russia all also faces some serious fiscal problems. And so the interest in reaching some agreement and some stabilization, military stabilization is mutual in some sense. Thank you. You can stay up here because we're going to have some questions. So, so I'm going to uh, let them, anyone ask questions. And I think we have a microphone that runs around. Yes. Uh, so please wait for the microphone. And I know some of you, but not all. So I'm going to treat everyone the same and ask you to, to say your name yourself. So we have one here. Yes, my name is Jürgen, representing Riksdagskontoret. We were formed uh, in the wake of war, I have to organize, because public finances are the main ammunition in war. So uh, I just want to thank Julia for uh, a great um, uh, lecture on the consequences. And I, I just have a uh, question for you. Are there any things concerning the public finances that surprises you in terms of the expenditure side and the income side that so far the composition uh, is somewhat what you could not expect or, or if you could just brief uh, give us some words on that thanks Julia? Uh, yes thank you so much for your question from the revenue side we, we weren't expected that the people continue to pay taxes actually when the full-scale war began our government made a very uh, um, low tax uh, for this period of time in the beginning of the full-scale invasion but uh, we understood that not a lot of the companies uh, they use this opportunity to pay lower taxes and continue to pay taxes as normal ones. So from our side, it could be a very big benefit, actually. From the, um, uh, this is the first point. And the second point that uh, the unity of our parliamentaries who decided to cut all other um, non-crucial uh, expenditures except the uh, military ones. So this was a very fast decision. And also during the first year of invasion, uh, our Minister of Finance just made a handle uh, management of the budget and just made a decision from day to day, sometimes from hour to hour, to fix the issue as fast as they can. Thank you. Uh, we have some other questions here. Uh, hello, my name is Sarah, and I come from CEDA, the Swedish uh, International Development Agency. Hi, Johan. Uh, thank you very much. This is a very interesting topic. I'll ask Joseph this, because uh, I work with uh, Palestine and Israel, but uh, I guess the question is for everyone, really, is how to think about and calculate the estimated cost of loss of lives or rehabilitation or disabilities and, uh, you know, loss of future revenues, for example. I mean, there are some some global research on, on how to calculate like violence against children, for example, on, on societal costs in the future. And I, I think this is really uh, a valid uh, question in terms of war as well, not just to look at defense budgets or et cetera, but actually at the societal cost at large. And I'm, I'm just thinking a, a close family friend who was injured in Yom Kippur and, you know, 50 years later, it's still, um, something that affects you know everyday life uh, and in terms of of palestine of course the question is of destruction of infrastructure more i'm thinking about gaza but also the high number of prisoners uh, which is mainly young men and i'm thinking about the high number that has passed through the prison system since the first intifada really because there were higher numbers back then thank you joseph well i i 
the prisoners issue I didn't study, so I, I don't have a good feeling for the amount. And uh, as for the people who are dying in wars, there are two types of costs. Of course, one cost is the emotional cost, which is unmeasurable. And the other is the former thing, that you lose the future stream of incomes. Th this I put in my calculation. You should look in the book. It's not very high. But uh, you're right. In terms of emotional burden, I was a regular soldier in 73. You know, the wave of regular army that received the first attack of the Egyptians, in my case, and the Syrians. And I think that we are a cursed generation in a sense. And we feel it until today. I mean, it's, it's traumatic to some extent, especially now that it's 50 years, it comes back. So... But I don't know how to measure it. I just mention it whenever I talk about it. I forgot today that these are immeasurable costs, and we should do everything to avoid them. Hello, my name is Anna Granelli. I'm from the National Board of Trade. Um, I have a question for Julia. I mean, we heard from Joseph about um, the costs of um, the military conscription during this, uh, how did you call it, the narrow phase of the uh, uh, of the war, um, of the conflict. Now in, currently we have 4 million, if I'm correct, Ukraines living under temporary protection in the EU. What is, in Ukraine, how is the discussion in a sort of post-war uh, reconstruction phase I mean, this this is human capital that you're going to need to rebuild your country. Um, and, you know, how do you view these people, how to get them back into productive work at the same time, you know, maybe, maybe they've started establishing lives in the EU, um, which is good. And, and, you know, they've probably learned experiences. I'm working a lot with um, the uh, um, part of the EU accession process of Ukraine that is the uh, nearing to the internal market. So probably people can learn things that can be put to use in this process, but but still, you know, it's four million people. Uh, you would probably need them in Ukraine. They might not want to return all of them. And yeah, would be interesting to hear your reflections on this. Yeah, thank, thank you, you so do. much. Thank you. This is a very good question. We are very grateful for the Ukrainian side for the Europe to help our refugees to be safe uh, in Europe, of course. But yes, you're absolutely right that we need these people here in Ukraine to work for our country, to build it back. Uh, back. So this is a huge issue now that is, uh, as I know, work, um, with government of Ukraine works on because we need several things. So the first one, we need the safe safety for people because the majority of uh, people who left Ukraine, it was women with kids, with children. So, because from the first days of war, the men cannot uh, leave the country. So that's why the issue for them is to be uh, sure that they live in safe country. So we need to think about how to build this uh, insurance for them. And uh, the other issues is to, people need to work. So they we need, to create job places. And here is a huge uh, things about how to develop the economic perspective to make, to, to create more job places for them. And of course, human capital, it's uh, social sphere, uh, like uh, education places, uh, schools, and other, and other things. So that's why we continue to work on the work and the building the bomb shelters for all schools, universities, and of course, for all, um, um healthcare institutions so that's why this is a co complex issue that we expect for a short period of time um to attract people to be back here in ukraine so the jobs safety and of course social things thank you julia uh, question here Thank you. Um, my name is Ulf Kruse. I run a business network called Chamber Business Networks. So a question for you, Josef. Thanks for a great presentation. Now, there is a song called Is It Really Peace We Want at Every uh, Possible Cost or Prize? Do you see there is a, a limit? Obviously, the parts in, in the conflict, in the narrow conflict, make a decision every day to continue with the conflict, despite the, the lost opportunity or the cost of it. 
So is there uh, somewhere a breaking point when the lost opportunity or the cost of the conflict will be so big that they actually go into uh, real peace talks? I, I, I don't know. The problem is, in my view, in my analysis, is that at least now the the balance of power between the two sides, Israel and the Palestinians, is extremely asymmetric. And despite the economic cost, which I'm not sure also that the government is fully aware of it, I don't think they listen too much for me. So the, the, the balance is so, is so asymmetric in terms of military power, economic power, and political power also with the support of the US basically most of the EU in the Israeli occupation policy. And now you can add to it, even in the last few years, the, in a sense, the betrayal of the Gulf countries in the Palestinians. That before it, they used to stick to the Arab Peace Initiative and say, well, the precondition for normalization is going to be peace with the Palestinians. Now they, they are not saying it anymore, and they're actually having more and more relations with Israel. So given this asymmetric balance, it's very hard to think about a solution unless something seriously changes. Well, unless there is another Palestinian uprising. Because we know every time there was an intifada, things changed a little bit. After the first intifada came Oslo. After the second intifada came the evacuation of Gaza. Not completely, of course. So Probably the answer to your question is lots of blood. I don't want to end with that comment, so you won. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, it's a fascinating question. It's one that my, I spent a lot of time in my book discussing, you know, the cost-benefit analysis. And it's, I think maybe one also, I suppose, sort of alludes to it. You have a domestic cost-benefit analysis, but in a, in a total cost-benefit analysis for a decision maker, of course, you also have to um, consider the actions of, of the other key parties, such as the United States, the European Union, and, and, and the Middle East states around. And it, I think research shows that typically in the in the negotiation, in the rounds that have taken place, I mean, there have been a lot of serious peace talks, too, let's be honest about that. They haven't worked, obviously. In, in, in most of those, there has been a tendency to offer positive incentives from the United States and the European Union. Like, if Israel and Palestine does this and this, they will give them more things, you know, positive. Um, there's some research that would suggest that, or economic, which the economists is here and here, but as that, there has been research showing that humans react more to negative uh, incentives because they're here, status quo, and they get positive is nice, but it's just a, what a, a negative uh, disincentive or a, a negative impact, a, a stick rather than a carrot. And I think there's one example, I think, in the United States in, in, the, in the first Camp David negotiations in 1979-80, where they actually threatened um, or the Israeli side with withdrawing certain support. And that is some research suggests that that had an impact on on the decision makers, but generally, uh, you know, the key actors tend to offer positive inducements, uh, and so that's that's in, something one can look at. But you know, Johan, there is a very famous uh, line of research in economics called the reveal preference, initiated by Paul Samuelson. And if we are that long without the U.S. or Europe imposing a solution. Well, what? You have to, a little strong. You have to speak a little louder. If we are after this long period without a peace solution, it means that maybe they don't want it that much. Hmm. Okay, we have already run over time a little bit, so I'm going to thank uh, SNS for hosting this, and I thank everyone here for for coming uh, to this seminar. And of course, I thank very much the the panelists. So thank you all. <laughs>